him today. He is marvelous. He's outstanding. He's glorious. He's magnificent. Jesus. Mm. When you just think about the things that he has done, when you think about, glory be to God, how he's opened doors for you that could never be shut anymore, and how he has shut some doors that can't be opened anymore. When you think about when your body was racked with pain, glory to God, and you put medicine in your body, but it didn't help nothing. But soon as you called on the name of Jehovah Rapha, the God that healeth thee, my God, when you just think about the goodness of Jesus, you can't help but to praise him. You don't need no man nor no woman or no music to prompt you to pay, praise your God. Because when you was in your dire situation, I'm quite sure there was not no worship team. My God, when you was going through what you was going through, there was nobody to pump you up. It was just you and Jesus. You had to give him the fruit of your lips. And that's what he requires right now. The fruit of your lips, my God. For this is your reasonable sacrifice. Just to bless him for who he is. Just to bless him for who he is. Jesus. When we understand quite clearly what we see going on in the world right now, people are going into the malls and not sure they're going to come out alive anymore. People walking around with AK-47s on, on the subway. Glory be to God. You don't know who you're going to pass on the street. It is imperative as children of God that while we can praise him, you praise him. Because you're not just praising him for Sunday, <laughs> you're praising him for Monday, and for Tuesday, and for Wednesday, and for Thursday, and for Friday. You're praising him for next week. My God. Oh, he is an awesome God. And we thank God that we are in the land of the living one more time. That we are able to give him the fruit of our lips one more time. Oh, he is our savior. He is marvelous. He's marvelous. As dear Mother Millie used to say, he is sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. Ah, oh, there's nobody like him. Glory be to God. There is nobody like him. There is no lover like him. Glory be to God. I got you. I want you to hear that. There's no lover like Jesus. Huh. <laughs> I think I better leave that one alone too. Jesus. Ah, Shaka Taraboshi. Oh, it is a blessing to see each and every one of you once again. It really is. It's a blessing to see you. I realized that the enemy didn't have his way with you this week because you're here. Glory to God. I dare say, even some of you this morning decided that you didn't want to come, but somehow you had to get up and come. Because God does have a word for you. Yes, he does. He has a word for you. I thank God for each and every one of you. I really do. And we pray daily for all of greater Zion. That during these 50 days of consecration, when we come out, we're going to be brand new people. Uh, yeah. We're going to be brand new. Glory be to God. We're praying that God will meet your needs and fight your battles, will encourage and strengthen you. And I know you don't have to look at me and shake your head, yeah, but I know maybe some of you may have stumbled and your one meal a day turned into two meals. And, but it's okay. It's okay. Because, see, fasting is not about the meals. Fasting is your heart. It's your heart. And if you know that you blew it this week, well, just repent and keep it, keep it stepping, that's all. Just keep it stepping. I know that you was crying and hungry. Your stomach was making all kinds of noises. And you decided to just relent and give in. But it's okay. Am I in the house? Oh, I know I am. I know I'm in the house. But it's okay. It's okay. If God would judge us because we didn't fast, we'd be in, in a problem. We'd have a problem. We'd have a problem. We really would. <laughs> we'd have a problem. 
But he has given us a word today, my God, and we thank God for the word. Just one scripture he gave, just one. He has allowed me to see this week and to hear certain things that um, I know this is what he wants greater Zion to hear today. So that's John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14, verse 27. Father, we want to thank you today and give you all the glory, give you all the honor to bless your name. We want to thank you, my God, for the privilege one more time to stand behind this sacred desk and to give your word to this people, my God. We want to thank you and praise you for all the blessings that you have poured down upon us thus far, for the favor that you have given us, dear God. We just want to thank you, my God, that the blood is yet running warm through our veins today, and we have breath in our lungs, and we have activity of our limbs, and we are in our right mind. We just want to thank you, glory be to God, for the opportunity, my God, just for the opportunity to be among your people one more time. And as this word goes forth, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that it will land on good ground, that we will be able to see the manifestation of it, my God. And Father, we just give you all the praise and the honor in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I just want to talk to you about the gift of peace. You may be seated. The gift of peace. Because whether we realize it or not, the gift of peace that Jesus has given us is truly a gift. It's a gift. We see here in John chapter 14, it starts out by Jesus, the very first verse of let, your, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. He goes on to say, you know, but in that particular text, you know, he, Jesus talks with the disciples, he's preparing them because he's leaving. Jesus is now preparing to leave. And he's trying to prepare his saints, I mean his disciples, for his leaving. So he tells them this. And he says this in the 14 and 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive unto you myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way you know. And here's Thomas asking Jesus a question. I'll paraphrase it, but you can see it in John chapter 14, verse 6. He says, I don't know where you're going. How do we know? And Jesus answers quite clearly that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Then he goes on to say this. If you know me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Now, Philip asks the question, when did we see him? And Jesus calmly, he says, Philip, how long have you been with me? How long have you walked with me? Huh? How long? And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. So when you see me, you see the Father. And if you don't believe that, believe by the words that I speak in the wor and the works that I do. Believe that. And he goes on to, Jesus goes on to talk about the Father. And he talks about himself. And he talks about the fact that he is leaving. And he's trying to prepare them when he goes. But it seems that they've been walking with him for these three years and a lot of things that they have missed. They have missed. They were so caught up sometimes in the, the giftings and the, all that he, the miracles that he did. They lost sight of who he is. He has told them on more than one occasion that the Father is in him and he is in the Father. But now that he's getting ready to leave, that truth escaped them. He says, I'm going to leave you a comforter. 
I'm going to leave you a comforter, someone to help you along the way. You can see him, but the world can't. Now, here's Judas asking the question. Jesus, how come the world can't see him? Jesus answers him quite clearly. Those that love me and obey my commandments will see him. But those who do not love me and don't obey my commandments will not see him. So Jesus is trying to explain to them, glory be to God, before he leaves, that even though he's leaving, he is not going to leave them comfortless. All right? He's not going to leave them comfortless. He tells them, and I will say to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall abide in you. Important statement. Important statement. So Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm with you now. I am your comforter. But the time is coming where I have to go to my father. And he says in John that you should be happy that I'm leaving, that I'm going to my father, that I'm going to leave you a, a comforter, another comforter. I won't leave you by yourself. I'm going to leave you the parakeet, the paraclete, the advocate, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. You see, and what we must understand about this paraclete is the fact that in the earth right now, we have the Holy Spirit. He is our paraclete. But Jesus is our paraclete in heaven. He is our advocate. He is our helper. Amen? So, but Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you like this. I'm not going to leave you unprotected. This comforter, the Holy Spirit, that the spirit of truth that I am going to send to you, he's going to reveal to you everything that I have told you. I'm going to ask the Father to send it through me to you in my name. So you will not be comfortless. And so you need to understand about the fact about you're not by yourself. That the Holy Spirit, as long as you are saved, the Holy Spirit is in you. Amen. You just read, it abides, he abides in you. It is a he, he is not an it. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. Amen? The word tells us quite clearly about the Holy Spirit. It tells us that he knows the mind of the Father. Only the Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Father. And as the Father speaks, glory be to God, the Holy Spirit relays. It goes through the Father, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit. Because everything is done in decency and in order. Not like... See, things are done in the earth right now. If I'm on the job and I don't like you, instead of me going to my supervisor, I go to, directly to the boss. That's wrong. Amen? Or even in the church, if you are in some auxiliary or in some ministry, and the ministry leader, my God, gets on your last nerve, instead of going to that ministry leader, you go straight to the pastor. You're out of order. And you will be rebuked for it. Because if you come to me, I'm going to ask you, did you go to your leader? So Jesus is saying, I am not going to leave you comfortless. But he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. <clears throat> let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 16, 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So Jesus is making two statements here. He's letting you know about the world's peace. The world's peace. In the world's peace, you're going to have tribulation. In the world's peace, you're going to have problems. There is no peace in the world. There shall be no peace in the world until the prince, the prince of peace manifests himself. The peace in the world is temporary. You happy today and tomorrow you're all upset. Peace. Anybody need peace in here? I want to make sure I'm in the right house. Okay. Mm -hmm. Peace. 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 John 15, 19 says, if you were in the world, the world would, have, would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, 
Therefore, the world hateth you. Let me repeat that for somebody that I was talking to. If you were in the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Amen? So don't be so caught up about you want people to like you in the world. They're not going to like you. They hated Jesus. Amen? And we are followers of Jesus. So what makes you think that they're going to love you more? They're not. Because the spirit that dwells inside of you is against the spirit that dwells in the world. This world's peace is full of noise. It's full of irritation, conflict, disturbance, aggravation, and strife. That's the peace that you have in the world. But Jesus said, the peace that I have with you, first of all, it is his best. It's his best. It was his last and his dying legacy. Before he went to crucifixion, he gave this scripture to his disciples. His dying legacy that he gave peace. And there's something about a dying legacy. When a person's on a deathbed and they make a statement, they make that statement as being truth. You okay? Any of you who ever watched Cowboys or Murder Pictures on TV or whatever, the deathbed confession, okay? The person has now died. But what they have said, because the people figure, well, if the man's dying, he ain't going to lie. That's what they figure. If the man is dying, he's that close to death, he definitely shouldn't be lying. They, so they counted it as truth. So Jesus, in his confession before he goes to the crucifixion, he says this, peace I give unto you, my peace. If you, we have studied Isaiah 53 a lot, amen? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The test of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen? We know that. But I want to just deal with that chastisement part for our peace. I want to deal with that. We talk, we're talking about a gift of peace, are we not? Let me show you what it costs for this gift. For this gift. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He became our substitute. The discipline physically that we should have gotten, Jesus took. The severe, severe punishment that we should have gotten, Jesus took. The correction that we should have gotten, Jesus took. The criticism that we should have gotten, Jesus took. Jesus took the world peace on himself. He put it on him, the chastisement on him, on himself. And he replaced it, my God, with his peace. If you go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, there's a, a verse here. And it says, then released he Barnabas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. That word scourge caught my attention. If, in fact, you was, had viewed the last seven words, you, sure, you saw Minister Nadine put some pictures up there about a whip. But let me just identify some th certain things to you. Scourging, a Roman implement by severe bodily punishment. It consisted of a handle and about a dozen leather cords with jagged pieces of bones or metal on each end. To make the blow more painful and effective, they tied, my God, the person to a post. Blows were ap applied to the bare back and loins, and sometimes to the face and bowels. The flesh was cut with each blow. A price was going to be paid for this gift of peace. It's called flogging. Flogging was permitted by the law up to 40 stripes in Deuteronomy 25 and 3. The Jews reduced it to 39 stripes in 2 Chronicles 11, 23, 25. If the scourge used on Jesus had 12 tongues and he was hit 39 times, that should make 468 stripes he took on his back to give us the gift of peace. 
That is the chastisement that he took for us. 468 stripes. His back was cut open. He was marred. Isaiah 52, 40, 14 tells you that. As many were astonished at thee, his vintage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Isaiah 52 and 14. This is what he took on for the chastisement of our peace. 468 stripes, my God, that you and I can have the peace that he gave us. Let that sink in for a moment. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23. So when problems come, and problems will come, children of God, because we are not exempt from problems. But the answer is, don't let those problems get into your heart. Because you have to know that Jesus, before he was crucified, gave you the gift of peace. And the only way that that peace can be taken is that you give it up. You have to allow the situations of the world to snatch the peace from you. So you're telling me, you're telling yourself that the problems that you are going through right now are much bigger and stronger than Jesus. You're telling me right now, you're telling yourself that he took those 468 stripes on his back bare, cut flesh cut open for nothing. For nothing. 468 on a bare back. And because scripture says he was unrecognizable, that, must, that tells me that that flogging that they did, some of it hit him in his face. And in his loins. But he did not mutter a word because he was doing it for you and I. He was trying to prepare us for the trials and tribulations of the earth and the world and what's going on in the world. He says, I know that you're going to have trials in the world. I know that you're going to have problems. Not only problems, my God, in the home. You're going to have problems in your house. You're going to have problems all over the place. But because I have given you peace, you should be able, my God, not to succumb to it. You should not react like the world reacts. So my question is, why do we react that way? Why do we think that the things that we are going through are so insurmountable that it allows, we allow it to affect our body? It affects our appetite. It affects our countenance. It affects us, my God, our physical structure. When people are going through, you know when they're going through. All of a sudden, they're walking around hunched over, their head down to the ground, face all wrinkled up, like they have lost their best friend, and Jesus has given you the gift of peace. But instead of us believing what Jesus said, and remembering, and I'm going to continue to reiterate it over and over again until it sinks into your head that he took 468 stripes on his bare back for the peace that he's going to give to us. And we just give it up like it's nothing. Somebody could say, boo, and my peace is gone. Things happen. We are in this world. It says that we are pilgrims just passing through. It doesn't say we're flying over the world. We're in the world. Things happen. Problems come. But Jesus says, peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. Then he says, because when you allow the peace of the world to infiltrate your mind first and then go down into your heart, that problem has a cut buddy. 
And it's called fear. Fear. You become afraid. You become afraid. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Of a sound mind. I could stay there for a moment, but I'm not. I choose not to talk about people today. Hmm, picture that. So not only did he give us peace, his peace, but he has alerted us that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us a spirit, my God, of power and of love and of a sound mind that we can endure the things that are going on in our life. We must understand, as Christians, we're going to go through it. As a matter of fact, because you are a child of God, and you name Jesus as your Savior, you are going to go through. You're going to go through. Don't think that you're just going to fly through earth and go straight to heaven without going through something. You're going to have problems. Jesus says, your major enemy, glory be to God, and I'm not talking about people, is going to be in your household. The people that love you the most will give you the most problems. Because they, some, there's something about love that makes people think that they have liberty. That they can say what they want to say and do what they want to do to you and you're supposed to accept it because I love you. That's the wrong kind of love. They take liberties they shouldn't be taking. People that's because if it's not your family, people that you don't care about, you can just walk away and it'll never bother you. But when there's somebody in your house or someone that you love and that you care about and they, my God, do things to you, it hurts you. It hurts you. But this is all to build up your character. Why do you think Jesus sent his disciples to Jerusalem first? He sent them home first. Get yourself together home. And then you could be the overnight wonder. So, just gift of peace that Jesus has given to us, his children. This was his dying legacy before he was crucified. Before he was crucified. My God. He took on these 468 stripes on his bare back. And if any of you remember when you was a kid riding a bicycle, see back then, some of you older saints, they didn't require you to have the things on your knees and the helmets on your head and on your elbows. You was riding the bike and you fell and skid on that cement. The flesh would just, you see it. You see it. But that was just small. Picture that on Jesus' back. How his flesh just parted. Parted. Picture that. But he did it for you and I. Here Isaiah the prophet is prophesying some 750 years into the future what Jesus was going to take on for you and I. So this didn't happen overnight. This was my God prophesied to happen. Jesus is the author of it. He knew what was going to happen. But look at the love that he has for you and I. He took on his back. How many stripes? 468. Opened up his back. Opened up his back. Slicing it on his face. That's not talking about the crown of thorns that was on his head. That the blood came running down. That's not talking about the spear that pierced him in the side. And blood and water came out. That's not talking about the nails that were placed in his hands and in his feet. I'm not talking about that. That was after the 468 stripes. I know maybe they don't like to talk about that except on Good Friday. But we're talking about it now. 
It's needful. We can't forget the price that our Savior paid for our gift of peace. And it is a gift. He had to pay for that gift in order to give it to us. And we have the audacity, the mitigated goal to walk around mumbling and complaining, angry. There's nothing worse than an angry saint. You ever see the cartoon Angry Birds? Face all time wrinkled up. Spend more time being angry than you do being happy. Get to the point sometimes where saints, my God, find stuff to get angry about when nothing is wrong. Because they're so used to having that kind of a countenance. Neglecting the fact that Jesus has given us the gift of peace. Not as the world gives. Not as the world gives. I give you my peace. I give you my best. I give you my last. I give you my dying legacy. That you shall be able to endure this walk while you're on this earth until I come back. Or until I come get you. However it may be. Jesus says, I will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Here's that mind thing again. Jesus says, I give you a spirit of a sound mind. But you've got to keep your mind in perfect peace. You've got to keep your mind stayed on Jesus. How easy it is sometimes for us to switch. How easy it is. There are times our mind is on Christ and all of a sudden, boop, we switch. It's like a light switch, off and on, off and on, off and on, off and on, whichever is convenient, off and on. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus does not say in Isaiah 26 and 3 that I should turn my mind on, off and on. He says I should keep my mind in perfect peace by keeping my mind stayed on him. That's the only way. I've got to keep my mind stayed on Jesus. That means when I'm going through trials and tribulations, I got to keep my mind stayed on Jesus. When people are on my last nerve, I got to keep my mind stayed on Jesus. When things are not working out the way I think they should work out, I keep my mind stayed on Jesus. When I don't have no money, my mind is stayed on Jesus. When I'm broke, my mind is stayed on Jesus. When my body's racked with pain, my mind is stayed on Jesus. Because he is the only one that can help me. When there are times when the Lord will remove people out of our path because we use people as a crutch. We start relying on people more than we rely on Jesus. And when you start relying on people, you have neglected the 468 stripes that Jesus took because you're relying on world peace, world substitution. And Jesus says, I am the substitute. I am the substitute for you. I am the propitiation of your sins. I am the one that paid a price for you. I paid a dear price to give you peace. A dear price. That there should be no reason any child of God should walk around angry. Things happen. Why did he say be angry but sin not? Doesn't he say that? Jesus got angry but he didn't sin. Because the sin comes when you start reacting, letting that wrath come. And please don't tell me, saints, you never had wrath since you've been saved. Oh, come on. Tell the truth. Don't tell it, you know. I hope you repented of it. When you said you wanted to bust somebody in the head with a hammer, you said, just repent of it. Repent of it. Or the person cut you off on the road while you were driving. All of a sudden, little words come out your mouth. Just come flowing. Like the rivers of waters? Yeah. But that's the wrong kind of water. That's polluted water. Yeah. But if you keep your mind stayed on Jesus, I know sometimes it's rough. But you have to condition yourself. You have to realize that he is your only help. You have to realize that. So the Lord many times will remove people out of your path. He will remove them. You'll have nobody to call on, call on the cell phone. 
Or when you call, they don't answer. When you text people, they don't answer back at the time you think they should answer back. It's all a setup. So you start relying on Jesus, that your mind could be stayed on him. Why does he want our mind stayed on him? Because as your mind is stayed on him, then he can download, my God, some solutions to the problems that you're going through. When your mind is stayed on him, then he can give you answers to the problems that you are going through. He can reveal certain things to you. But if your mind is not stayed on him and stayed on the world, you're going to get the wrong answer. You're going to get a scam. Oh, yeah. Because the world doesn't have the answer for your spiritual situation. The God that you serve does. And when you understand that he is the one that's ordering your footsteps, why not keep your mind stayed on him? He's given us this gift of peace. And it did not come without paying a price. And he had to pay the price. Again, Isaiah 53 and 5. Yes, he was wounded for our transgressions. Yes. Yes, he was bruised for our iniquities. Yes. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Peter says, we were healed. That chastisement, that was for us. We could not have taken no 468 stripes on our bare back. We could not have taken a pinch without saying, ouch. The word says he didn't mumble a word. Because he, in his mind, had us on his mind. He knew that we was coming, future generations, and he had to prepare a way of safety for us. He had to prepare some kind of armor for us that when we end this world and as we go through this world, we could have some kind of protection that we could be victorious. Is every day a good day? No, it's not. No, it's not. I don't walk around every day grinning. No, I do not. There are some days that things really, really hit me. And I have to slap myself and say, hey, come on, man. Put your mind back on God. Every now and then, you got to slap yourself. I didn't say slap anybody. I said slap yourself. <laughs> Every now and then, you got to work yourself up and say, hey, what's going on? I can't go there. I'm in the wrong, it's a dark place. I can't go there. My answer is not there. My answer is in Christ Jesus. You got to slap yourself back into the realization of who you serve and who is your savior. I know that we are going through this coronavirus and all this other stuff. But I also know that the God I serve speaks, even in this coronavirus. He tells us what to do, how to do, and when to do. He opens doors. Oh, yes, he does. He opens doors. I'm not saying anything about to anybody here about the vaccination. That's, that's your choice. All I know is that what God does for my wife and I, he opens doors. When people say can't, God says can But you got to keep your mind stayed on him in every aspect of your life if you want the peace that he has given. Because when you take your mind off of him, you're taking the peace away. You are relying on the things of the world. And has not the world done enough damage to you? Huh? My God. And here our Savior has given us, my God, his peace, spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind, given us his Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct us into all truth, given us the Holy Spirit, my God, the advocate, the helper, the paraclete, to help us, 
my God, to stay with this peace. When things are getting messed up, the Holy Spirit can kick it. At times when we don't know what to pray, pray for it. His word says that he utters, utters, utters for us, murmuring to God on our behalf. Why would God the Father want us to be in turmoil when his son has made a way to give us peace? And the Lord sent this word today because I do understand quite clearly that there's some of his children sitting right here. I'm not in peace. It's not in peace. Things have really been affecting you. And it just didn't happen overnight. It's been this way for a while. The word of God tells me quite clearly that Satan left Jesus for a season. So you have a momentary time of peace, but that problem come right back. Come right back. Doom. I understand I heard the word last week from co-pastor. And I said, wow, Lord, I don't want to say anything about that. But as the Lord was giving me this word, when you don't have peace, you have confusion. Confusion makes you, makes you make the wrong decisions. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say to that. No. When you don't have peace, you make wrong decisions. You make decisions according to your emotions. You make decisions according to the way your body feels. You make decisions according to what other people are saying. So it brings confusion because you're trying to listen to your body, trying to listen to other people, and God knows you're trying to listen to yourself and you're more confused even then. But when you keep yourself in perfect peace and your mind stayed on Jesus, there is no confusion because there's no confusion in Jesus. There's only clarity. There's only truth. There's no confusion. You don't say, was that you, Jesus? No. When Jesus speaks to you about your situation, there's no confusion. You know that it's Jesus speaking. Confusion comes when you don't know who the heck is speaking. You don't know who to listen to. I'm going to leave that alone. I am. I am. I think the point got across. Confusion comes to those whose minds are not stayed on Christ. But he loves us so much. We understand that the very first, my God, spirit of love is the fruit of the spirit is love. The very first one is love. Everything emanates from love. Amen? Love, joy, and then peace. Peace. And that spirit that we're talking about is the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you. <coughs> so it's not, excuse me, so it's not like you can't have it. It's just that you are denying it. Do you got love? Do you got joy? Well, if you don't have the first two, how are you going to have, the, have the next one? Because if you have no joy, you can't have peace. That's not there for no reason. It's there for a purpose. It goes in that order. Love is the foundation. Love is the that agape love is the foundation. And from that agape love, you should have joy. Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. You should be joyful. Because of the love that you have for me. He says it in John 14. Because you love me, you love the Father. I'm in the Father, the Father is in me, and I am you. You should love me as I love you. Joy. Then he says about the peace. But if you don't have love, where's your joy? And if you don't have joy, goodness knows, no, you don't have peace. Peace. 
I'm not even going to go to the rest of them. But if you don't have peace, you can't be long-suffering with people. And if you don't have long-suffering, you can't be gentle. If you're not gentle, it means you don't have no faith. And God knows you're not meek. Temperance. Against such things there is no law. But the first three, love, joy, peace. It goes in that order. You can't have peace without having love. Jesus tells us that in John 14. When you go home, read John 14. Jesus said it quite clearly. He said that more than one time. He says it more than one time. This is why he answered Thomas. This is why he answered Philip. This is why he answered Judas, not Iscariot. This is why he answered them. And he said basically the same thing. I am in my father. My father is in me. And I am in you. This is what he says. And if you love me and obey my commandments, you can ask anything in my name. And it shall be given unto you. John 14 says that. Amen? He says that twice. But he says, I am in my Father. My Father is in me. I'm in you. You in me. But you got to love me and obey my commandments. Ask anything that you want. In my name. Because when you're asking in Jesus' name, you're asking in the Father's name, and you're asking in the Holy Spirit's name, and it will be given unto you. But the key word there is love. And if you love Jesus, you will obey his commandments. And you will not allow things of the world to deter you and make you angry person. Do you all see that in John 14? When you get a chance, read it. He says it quite clearly. This is before he's going to be crucified, putting everything in order. Everything in order. If you see me, Philip, you've seen the Father. How long have you walked with me, Philip? Three years. How long have you walked with Jesus? How long have you walked with Jesus and still don't know who he is? This is what Jesus was saying. Philip, how long you walk with me? How long? You saw the signs. Philip, how long you walk with me? And so the question is asked to his children. How long have you all been walking with me, with Jesus? How much love do you have for him that you're willing to obey his commandments and realize it's the will of the Father, my God, to bless you through his Son? But he says you have to love me and obey my commandments. Then, and see, we love the, we love the quote that scripture. Jesus said, you know he said it, I can ask anything in his name and it shall be given unto me. Yeah, you've got to read the verses behind that, in front of it. He makes a statement. He didn't say you couldn't have it. But he is saying there's some steps that you have to go through in order to get it. He's not going to bless someone that doesn't love him. Judas, not of Iscariot, asked him the question. Jesus said, answered the question. He says, those that love me and obey my commandments, those are the ones that I'm talking to. The ones that don't obey me and don't love me, I have nothing to do with. This is what he says. Jesus has given us the assurance that we can have peace in this world. 
the comforter, the advocate, the paraclete, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead is walking with us. He is with us. My God, he's with us. He never leaves us, never, nor forsakes us. He is right there with us, walking with us. He is with you. He walks with you. This Jesus said, I ask the Father in my name to send the comforter. That he's with us. Even when you act crazy, he's with you. That's why he sends conviction. He's telling you, get it straight, repent. But he's with you. How do I know? Because Jesus says so. He says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. I am with you until the end of time. Not like man that will leave you and come back and leave you and come back. And sometimes they don't come back. And you should thank God they ain't come back. Sometimes you need to stop chasing after people that don't want no part of you. They make it quite clear they don't want no part of you. Leave them alone. But sometimes people want friends so bad, they take anybody to be a friend. But Jesus says in 14, this peace, I leave with you. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. This is what he was saying. And I just, we went through the whole thing about the scourging, Matthew 27, 26. That word scourge is right there. And I explained what scourging is. The nine tail, the bones and the metal on the end of it. That when it's hit the back of a bare back, it opens up the flesh. Twelve, my God, flaps. Thirty-eight stripes. Thirty-nine stripes. Four hundred and sixty-eight stripes took it on his back. Back split open. Back split open. And I don't see any place. They offered him vinegar and gall for his mouth. I don't see anything that was asked to give him for his back. Maybe you see it in your, your Bible. I don't see it in mine. That scourging, that whip, sometimes hits the face. That's why he was unrecognizable. The chastisement he took, the punishment physically, that's what the chastisement is, physical punishment he took, that you and I could have peace that he left with us. He left this peace. He left this peace with us. And then the Lord now sends the word into greater Zion and to those who will view it later on. That some are allowing the situations of the world to snatch their peace. They have given their peace up because they cannot take the peace from you. You have to give it up. Amen? You have to give this peace up. You have to willingly give peace up. You have to allow situations in the earth my God, to be so much so terrible to you and so insurmountable to you that you think your problems are bigger than Jesus. But yet and still, now you're coming to Jesus for help, and he's already given the help. This is why many times you don't get an answer for your prayer because you're asking for things that he has already given you. Now, I heard that ouch, yeah. Yes. There should be some more ouches in here. That's probably the reason why you have not gotten answers for your prayers yet. Because you're requesting something that God has already given you. He's already given it. He gave his life for it. And you're asking God. And so you have been asking for years. Lord, restore. Restore this. Restore that. Well, if it had not been restored in 12 years, does, maybe you need to slap yourself and say, maybe God don't want me to have it. Yeah. If it has not been restored, and you've been crying, doing all that you know how, and still has not been restored, 
Maybe God does not want you to have it. Maybe God is telling you to separate yourself from that ungodly thing. But sometimes we want to hang on to stuff. And that hanging on to things steals our peace. Steals our peace. I don't know. The older I get, the more peace I want. Really. There was a time that crying babies didn't bother me. But now I say, oh, please let that baby shut up. Give him a bottle. Yeah. But the older you get, the more you want peace. You want peace in your life. Do you not, children of God? Don't you want peace? Do you always want to walk around with turmoil? Like every day to you is like any other day. Every day is the same. You, you look forward to foolishness every single day because every day is foolishness. Oh, what tomorrow is going to hold for me now? Instead of thanking to the one who holds tomorrow. It's got so bad, I don't even want to come up my house sometime because I know something's going to happen. I remember when I was working at that museum, driving there, I was fine in the car until I got on Metropolitan Avenue. My God, getting closer and closer to that job. Oh, God. As soon as I got in my view, my stomach started getting tight. My head started hurting. I started getting angry, and I hadn't even punched the clock yet. I had allowed my peace. I gave my peace up. I gave it up. I was anticipating something happened that hadn't happened yet. I was basing it on something that happened before. Is it in the house right now? Am I talking to you? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Huh? There's two honest people in here. Thank you, Jesus. But there's more than two in here. There's more than two. And I keep hearing it, and I'll say it again. You're asking God for things that he's already given you. This is why you don't have an answer. Start praising him for it things instead of keep asking him for things that he's already given you. The word says, I, what concerns you concerns me. This is what Jesus is saying. Nothing is too small and nothing is too big. The problem comes when we keep beg begging and begging and asking and asking and we don't praise him for it. Jesus is not deaf. He heard you the first time. As a matter of fact, he knew you was going to say it before you said it. So after you made your supplication, why not start praising him for the answer? Why not start giving him the glory for the answer? Otherwise, the word wouldn't say, call that which is not as if it already is. That's faith in action. I think I told you before, and I'll say it again. Faith and doubt, one cancels out the other. You cannot have faith and doubt. You cannot. It's like having pancake with no syrup. It just don't work. It don't work. Glory be to God. That's why when God gave me my wife, he gave me the pancake and the syrup. You know? So. so. That's not in my notes, so I'm sorry. Okay. I'm trying to make you understand. Oh, God, help me. Pray for your bishop. Pray for me. That's all. That's all you can do is pray for me. I'm God's child. You know how foolish I was when he called me. Peace I give unto you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now you see what that last part says, and I'm going to close. Let not your heart be troubled, and let it not be afraid. What is that it? Your heart. 
your heart. Your heart. It starts in the mind and it goes down into your heart. Let not your heart be afraid. Starting the palpitations. Starting all the stress. That's what this is talking about. Stress affecting your physical health. Because you have allowed some problems, my God, to infiltrate your body. You have allowed your peace that Jesus has given you. You've given it up to a problem in the earth. In other words, again, you're saying that my problem is bigger than Jesus. That gift of peace that he gave, that doesn't apply to my problem. Because my problem is bigger than the peace that he gave me. And that is not true. We as children of God should be walking around with the peace of God. He is called the Prince of Peace. Is he not John 9 and 6? Isn't he, isn't he called the, the Prince of Peace? Huh? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of Peace. Jesus. Saints of God. The Lord sent the word today because he wants you to be at peace. There's enough strife in the world right now. There's enough stuff coming over the airways to make people afraid. Every day now we're hearing about another mass shooting. Every day. We're hearing about people missing all of a sudden. We're hearing about the community of the Asians being, my God, attacked all the time. We see here in all kinds of stuff, hit and run drivers. My Lord, what's going on in the world when people can run over somebody and keep going? Every day we're hearing about things, my God. Every single day you turn on the news and you hear something. After a while, we got to ask God, don't let me get callous because I keep hearing the stuff over and over and over again. Don't let me get callous to it and stop praying about it. Because it's happening more and more and more and more. 19 years old with an AK-47 going into FedEx and killing people. 19 years old. Life has not even begun. And now he, then he turned around and kill yourself. You see how wicked the adversary is? You see how wicked he is? Have you killed somebody and turn around and kill yourself? But when you have this peace of Jesus Christ that he has given you and I, those thoughts should never infiltrate your mind. Why would I want to kill myself when the Lord Jesus is the one that made this body? The word says life and death are in his hands. His hands. Not my hands. But again, we can do more damage to ourselves than the adversary can ever do when we allow the peace that our Savior has given us to escape us. We make foolish decisions, and with every foolish decision, there's a consequence. There's always going to be a consequence. Always. Just stand to our feet, please. I think I have given you what I needed to give you today. I think that the word has went out there. I mean, it's quite clear. Or maybe it was clear to me because I had to study it all week. I don't know, but it was clear enough. But John chapter 14 is quite clear. In that chapter, John, Jesus repeats certain things to get his point across to the disciples. Maybe because they was hard-headed or maybe because they didn't believe him. But when he said that you should be happy for me because I'm going to the Father, that means they were sad because he said he was leaving. This is why he said, I'll send another comforter to you. So you don't have to be sad. I'm sending a comforter to you to do to for you that which I would have done. This is the same chapter that says that you shall be doing more works than I did. That's what he says. Because I'm sending you the comforter, you shall be able to do more works than I did.
468 stripes. The chastisement of our peace. Back split wide open. Face cut. Unrecognizable. Unrecognizable. His vintage was like no other man. God. This is before. 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 The crown of thorns was put on his head. This is before. The nails was put in his hands. This is before the nails was put in his feet. This was before he was pierced in his side and the blood ran out and the water sack around the heart was pierced and the water ran out. This was before, glory be to God, he was stripped naked. And I had to think about that because they 468 stripes on the back, bare back, and then they put a garment on open wound. So can you imagine the feeling that he had? That garment that they put back over him now when the wounds were still open? And then when he got on the cross, they stripped him again naked? But yet and still, I leave peace with you. He knew all of this was going to happen, but he still did it. Because he wanted to prepare you and I that we could be able to be victorious in this world until he comes back to get us or we just transition, whatever happens. But he prepared us as children that we could be victorious in this earth. We have no reason to walk around angry people. We have no reason, my God, to let problems of this earth, I don't care what they are, to overtake us. Because whatever your problem is, it is not bigger than Jesus Christ. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care you lose your house, it's not bigger than, he's more than able to give you another one. You lose your car. He's more than able to get another one. As a matter of fact, probably the car that you got now needs to be gone. Huh. Anytime you drive a car, you got to watch out for the potholes because you're scared your tire going to fall off. You can't get rid of the car. But he's more than able to replace anything that you lose as long as you're in him. As long as you are in him. If you love me and obey my commandments, you can ask anything that you will in my name and it shall be given unto you. These are the words of Jesus Christ. His words. Peace. I give you my gift of peace, my dying legacy, I give to you. My dying legacy. Before he was crucified, he left us peace. My God. My God. We thank God that he did this. Now that you know that he did it, now that you have the word again, if you are one of those who are walking around tormented, if you have actually lost your peace, you have given your peace up, you didn't lose it, you gave it up, and now you've heard this word, and you want us to pray with you, the middle aisle is open right now. The middle aisle is open. Now the Lord does not send a word into this house and nobody is in here. Don't let Mr. Pride snatch a blessing from you. It's nothing to be ashamed about. It's nothing to be ashamed about. We all have allowed these things to happen in our life, especially when it happens around loved ones. 
it happens. That our peace escapes us. We give it up. We give it up. Because I feel that my situation, Lord Jesus, is bigger than the promise that Jesus gave me. Glory to God. I need the ministers, pastors. Glory to God. Yeah. Yes, please. Glory to God. 